Welcome to worship. Uh, all are welcome uh, to the Lord's table. When we have communion this Sunday, we'll have uh, glasses filled with wine uh, for those who want uh, that for communion. And we also have grape juice for those who have grape juice. Um, we welcome all to the Lord's table, and we believe that uh, the body of Christ is here with us when we celebrate communion. Today, uh, we welcome Pastor Tom Hillier. He's retired, but of course, he's never totally retired because people like us need him at times and have to call him up and say, Tom, can you come and lead worship? And fortunately, we have him uh, here today. Uh, so thank you, Tom, for being with us. Uh, if there's, you know, because he's not here with us all the time, uh, if there's any problem with the miking or anything like that, just we'll make sure everybody can hear everything that Tom uh, will say today. Uh, otherwise, we have uh, a bunch of items in, in your bulletins. I think we, and on, online, I think you can, uh, you also have the same, basically the same program. There's lots of things going on as usual. Uh, I think church council has a meeting on Tuesday evening. So that's uh, part of this week. Let's see, uh, uh, Ralph, did you want to say anything on behalf of the Bach and Tata Choir? There is a big, uh, huge Bach, uh, Super Bach Sunday thing going on at 2 o'clock. Well, thank you, James. It's, um, it's Super Bowl Sunday, and we do a concert over 2 o'clock at Rose City Presbyterian Church. It's free, and it's called the Super Bach Concert. And whereas the Super Bowl features four quarters, we are featuring um, four different um, composers today who all worked in the same church at one time in, in Germany. So um, as I say, free, and it's a lot of loud music and a lot of fun. Yeah, and actually, if you see the program, there's one interesting thing. I, I noticed on the logo, on the inside, there's a football helmet but they superimposed box insignia on that. It was Actually, that was a great idea. I have to use that more often. Are there any other announcements from anybody? I'm missing something out there. Okay, then I think we can uh, begin our worship with uh, Jim. We'll ring the bell, and we can uh, start worship then. Thank you.
grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And also with you. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy for the peace from above and for our salvation. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy for the peace of the whole world, for the well-being of the church of God, and for the unity of all. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. Help, save, comfort, and defend us, gracious Lord. Let us pray. Lord God, write in our hearts the lessons of your law. Help us to see and understand the things we ought to do. And give us grace and power to do them. Through your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. ABC.
A reading from the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 30. See, I have set before you today life and prosperity, death and adversity. If you obey the commandments of the Lord your God that I am commanding you today, by loving the Lord your God, walking in his ways, and observing his commandments, decrees, and ordinances, then you shall live and become numerous, and the Lord your God will bless you in the land that you are entering to possess. But if your heart turns away and you do not hear, but are led astray to bow down to other gods and serve them, I declare to you today that you shall perish, you shall not live long in the, in the land that you are crossing the Jordan to enter and possess. I call heaven and earth to witness against you today that I have set before you life and death, blessings and curses. Choose life so that you and your descendants may live, loving the Lord your God, obeying him and holding fast to him, for that means life to you and length of days, so that you may live in the land that the Lord swore to give to your ancestors, to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob. Word of God, word of life. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. gospel for today is written in the fifth chapter of the gospel according to St. Matthew, beginning at verse 21. Jesus said to the disciples, you have heard it, you have heard that it was said to those in ancient times, you shall not murder, and whoever murders shall be liable to judgment. But I say to you that if you are angry with a brother or sister, you will be liable to judgment. And if you insult a brother or sister, you will be liable to the council. And if you say, you fool, you will be liable to the hell of fire. So when you are offering your gift at the altar, if you remember that your brother or sister has something against you, leave your gift there before the altar and go. First be reconciled to your brother or sister and then come and offer your gift. Come to terms quickly with your accuser while you are on the way to the court with him. Or your accuser may hand you over to the judge and the judge to the guard, and you will be thrown in prison. Truly, I tell you, you will never get out until you have paid the last penny. You have heard that it was said you shall not commit adultery. But I say to you that everyone who looks at a woman with lust has already committed adultery with her in his heart. If your right eye causes you to sin, tear it out and throw it away. It is better for you to lose one of your members than for your whole body to be thrown into hell. And if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. It is better for you to lose one of your members than for your whole body to go into hell. It is also said, whoever divorces his wife, let him give her a certificate of divorce. But I say to you that anyone who divorces his wife, except on the ground of unchastity, causes her to commit adultery. And whoever marries a divorced woman commits adultery. Again, you have heard that it was said to those of ancient times, you shall not swear falsely, but carry out the vows you have made to the Lord. But I say to you, do not swear at all, either by heaven, 
for it is the throne of God, or by the earth, for it is his footstool, or by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king. And do not swear by your head, for you cannot make one hair white or black. Let your word be yes, yes, or no, no. Anything more than this comes from the evil one. This is the Holy Gospel. You may be seated. This time I'd like to ask the children to come forward for the children's sermon. Have a seat, kids. I'm going to go get something from the altar to show you, okay? How are you guys doing today? Thumbs up. What what's this? Bread. Looks a little different than the kind of bread that we might have at home, but it's basically just bread. I was thinking about all the ones that are put this down here. I was thinking about all the ones that are responsible for that bread. And we think about uh, the farmer that owns the land. We think about the one that drives the tractor to plow the dirt. And we think about the one that uh, is in charge of letting the water into the fields. And we think about the per person that drives the... Uh, machine that puts the, the wheat seed into the ground and we remember that uh, there's a group of people that run the big machines they're called combines that harvest the wheat and that was a job that I had when I was in college during the summer and then we think about the truck driver that takes the wheat to the uh, it's called an elevator it's a big silo and we think about the people that load the wheat into these big railroad cars and the trains go to the mill. And we think about the people that grind the wheat into the flour. Into flour. And we think about the people at the store that work at the store where the flour is sold. And we think about the people that get the flour from the store and then make the flour into bread and then we eat it. And so my question is, which ones of all those people that I mentioned, which one is the most important? Which one does the most to make the bread? That's what I say. They're all important, aren't they? But you know who there is someone who is the most important and that's God because God created the earth the ground the dirt God makes it rain God created the sun and God created people and gave them brains made them smart made them have created them to have hands and feet and legs and arms so that they could run the machinery and grind the wheat into flour and bake the bread into bake the flour into bread so god really is the most important one that makes that bread happen and of course the the last one that i need to mention is you and me because when we that bread gives us life 
And that bread gives us uh, all the things that we need to make our body strong. And this is a particular, the thing that's different about this bread is that we share this bread when we have communion. So in a, a little bit, you're going to be coming up to the altar with all of these people, and we're going to receive this bread together, and that helps us to make, that brings us into a group of people that we call the body of Christ. That helps us to be one with God and to have Jesus in our lives. So that's, I know that's a lot to think about when you eat a piece of bread, all those people. But that might be something for us to do sometimes, is to think about everyone that is involved in making such a simple thing like bread. Okay? Thank you very much. Pretty much all of my life, uh, I've had a particular role that I've taken on in my life. And the title of that role is The Class Clown. And so I'm always coming up with joint jokes or what I think are clever things to say that might make people laugh. And I've always tried to kind of bring some of that humor into my job as a pastor. And so one of the things that I often do is that when I start a sermon, I might say something humorous, maybe a little joke. But after reading this gospel lesson, <laughs> man, it's hard to come up with any jokes about that, isn't it? Wow. And we read these, you know, part of the jolt of this lesson is that quite often we get into this idea that one of the main things about Jesus is that he's a really nice guy. You know, he's all about love and helping people and doing loving, loving things for everyone and, and being nice, you know, kind of fits, fits in with all of us Midwestern Lutherans who were taught the same thing, you know, be a nice person. So it's a little harsh. I, and, and, you know, another thing that's going on here, too, is that we tend to think of, we tend to divide people up into good guys and bad guys. And we don't always think about it. We just kind of automatically assume that, uh, you know, there are good guys and bad guys. And the criminals and so forth, they're the bad guys, and they, they go to end up hopefully in prison so that they don't bother us. And the rest are just the rest of us are just pretty good people. And we're nice, and we uh, help each other, and we're good citizens, we obey the laws. Well, you know, most of them. And I, I've heard this uh, radio, commercial on the radio recently about a law firm that specializes in people who have been charged with drinking under the influence. Have, have you heard those commercials? And I think part of the uh, message of those commercials is that even though you've been pulled over for drinking and driving, and you're in trouble with the law, I might go to prison, you're basically a good person. And this law firm is here for you, because we know all of the ins and outs of that whole thing. And so we get into this idea of there being good guys and bad guys, and we tend to think of ourselves as being among the good guys. And so when Jesus 
says here that, yeah, we know that murder is wrong, but he says even if you're angry with someone, you're liable to the judgment just like a murderer. Well, who among us has, has never been angry? And when if you, if, if you insult someone, you are liable to the judgment. Well, that takes a lot of my jokes away. <laughs> if you call someone a fool, you're in danger of hellfire. And he talks about those who commit adultery has been uh, a, there's been a law against that for a long time, but he says even if you lust after someone, it's the same thing. And then he talks about divorce, and the, the laws that, the way that Jesus thinks about divorce is really different from the way we think about it, and the way we, our laws are structured. But, and so he talks about how those who are involved with divorce are under judgment. And then he talks about swearing falsely. Now, I don't, I'm not, he's not talking about saying bad words here. He's talking about what you do in court when, you know, I swear to tell the truth and so forth. And he says, why, do you, why should you have to do that? Why can't you, if it's, the answer to a question is yes, say yes. If it's no, say no. You don't have to do, even swear at all. So what's going on here? Why is Jesus talking like this? Like I say, it seems awfully harsh. Difficult for us to hear, mainly because, not only because it's coming from Jesus, but it hits us pretty hard. We know that we have been guilty of the many of the things that we may not be murderers or robbers or whatever, but we know that, when, that he's talking in many ways about us. And that's hard to hear. When I was in seminary, uh, when we talked about this passage, one of my professors said that what Jesus is trying to do here is up the ante in a poker game. And if you up the ante, the, um, the first initial bet that you give in a card game, that might make it difficult for some of the people to be involved. They don't have enough money. So the point is that what Jesus is doing here with these words is to help us to see how much we need him. Because we like to think of ourselves as basically good people. We're not as bad as others, especially those criminals. They really need some help. But we're, you know, we're adults, we're mature, we make good decisions, we follow the laws pretty close, and so we don't realize, or we rather don't think about the ways in which we, our actions and words hurt people, and that they should be judged, because we like to think of ourselves as being in charge, as being able to make good judgments as being people who really can, we can depend on ourselves. We don't need anybody else. Now, we don't think about these things consciously, but that's what's going on in the back of our minds quite often. So as much as we love Jesus, as much as we think he's a nice person and has some good things to say, we live our lives pretty much without him in mind. We don't need him. Now, some of what Jesus is talking about here kind of lines up with our first lesson from Deuteronomy, where Moses is talking to the people of Israel and giving them the word from God, and God is saying, if you obey my commandments as you enter the land of Israel, you're going to have a good life. You're going to have enough food. You're going to have shelter. You're going to have enough water to drink. You're going to have good fam strong families. You're going to be safe. But if you don't follow my commandments, then you won't receive all of those things. And so then Moses says, 
speaks God's word and says, therefore, choose life by obeying God's commandments, because if you don't, then you are choosing death. And so that's, I guess, maybe the harshest word of all, that if we don't follow God, as I mentioned to the kids, the, the one person, the one who is most important for making that bread is God. We, if without God, we wouldn't have the dirt and the sun and the water and so forth, or the people. And so if we don't choose God, if we choose ourselves to be in charge, then we're not choosing life. And then we're choosing, I guess, the biggest judgment, which is death. Now, one of the things that I kind of wonder about sometimes I wonder what it would have been like what would have been like to be a follower of Jesus, to be a disciple, follow him around and to see what he does and to listen to his words. And you know how it is. You, and this is true, like if, sometimes you send an email that, uh, to somebody that maybe, you know, you didn't, they could understand it in the wrong way. And uh, you, you have to be really careful about how you send an e or how you write out your email so that they'll understand what you're trying to say. Because a lot of what we want to say has to do with our facial expressions, has to do with maybe a glint in our eye or a smile on our face. And I think sometimes there are some things that Jesus says that are just downright funny. I think about that time when he healed somebody that was let down through the ceiling. You remember that? And so they were digging in the ceiling and all this stuff is coming down. I thought that was a pretty, pretty funny scene all the way around. And if Jesus is a human being like we are, well, then he was funny. I don't know if he was the class clown, but he was humorous. And so when we hear some of these things, like especially I think the, uh, exag what I call exaggerations, where he says, what am I found it? Uh, oh, uh, if your right eye causes you to, you to sin, tear it out and throw it away. If your hand causes you to sin, cut it, cut it off. And that sounds pretty harsh, but I kind of wish we could see the look on his face hear the way he says these words and realize he's exaggerating. He's trying to make a point. He's trying to help people understand where they really stand with God. And so he went about his ministry. He healed the sick. He fed the hungry. He preached good news to the poor. Sometimes he had to preach bad news to those who were in judgment of others. But I have a feeling that when he ended up on the cross, those who put him there, those who were trying to get rid of him, thought they were having the last laugh. They thought that the joke was on Jesus. Maybe you remember some of those words where the soldier said, looked up in Jesus, hey, if you're the son of God, why don't you come down off that cross and save all of us? can't even save yourself. So they thought the joke was on him. There's a very old tradition uh, in the Christian church. I don't know if you follow it here or not, but uh, it's something that happens on the Sunday after Easter. And it's a day when people tell jokes and have fun and maybe pull a couple of pranks on each other. I don't know if they put a pie in the face of the pastor uh, but they have some fun with it. And the idea behind that Sunday is because when Jesus was raised from the dead on Easter, it was God's way of telling the devil and telling death, the joke's on you. The one that you killed on the cross is alive. And the one that you thought was dead is bringing new life. And death itself, as scary as it is, 
not the final word. And so Holy Hilarity Sunday, whatever it's called, is a time to remember that finally God is pulling a joke on death and the devil and on all things that want to hold us down and giving us new life. There's a, another interesting thing in, in this gospel lesson, and that is that uh, it talks about when you bring your gift to the altar, make sure that you have reconciled with your brother or sister before you bring that gift up to the altar. Now that is actually one of the sources of a practice that we have in church on Sundays, and it's something we're going to do in just a few minutes, and that's sharing the peace. And when you say to each other in the congregation, peace be with you, and also with you, and you might be saying it to somebody that maybe did you wrong, not quite necessarily on good basis with. And by saying peace be with you and the other person says and with you also, you're recognizing that the only place where we can get the kind of peace and reconciliation and faith that we need is from God because now God is at peace with us. God has chosen us. We may have difficulty choosing life or death, but God has chosen us, and that's why we are alive. And so sharing the peace is like sharing that same peace that we get from God. Sharing that peace with each other. And that's not just something that we, we do just in church or just among ourselves. But sharing God's peace is one way of thinking about our life in general all of the different people that we are involved with. People at work, neighbors, family members, people at church, people in the different groups that we might belong to, and with strangers, people on the bus, people at work, people on the street, even the ones in tents. That peace that we share with God and with each other is something that we share, it's something that we can live. We are at peace. And that changes all of the different things that we do, the laws that we support as citizens of a democratic society, all of the things that we do to support those who are in need, those who are oppressed. So peace is God's, one of God's basic gifts to us. And that peace itself enables us to share that peace with each other. Okay, I'm, like I said, I'm the class clown, so I gotta end this sermon with a joke, okay? If that's all right with you, I don't know if it's very good, but. Um, so this dog walks into a telegraph office. Now I know that there might be some of you who don't know really what a telegraph is. I'll let you Google it. <laughs> so the dog walks into a telegraph office and there's a, a form there that you can write down what you want, the telegraph that you want, a telegram that you want to send, but the dog just kind of grabs it in his mouth and brings it over to the telegraph operator and gives it to him. And, and the operator, you know, he's a little perplexed by this whole thing. What, what is this going on with this dog? finally realizes the dog wants to sell the telegram. So he asks the dog, well, uh, what do you want this telegram to say? And the dog says, woof, 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 woof. And the telegraph operator says, well, now wait a minute. I only heard nine woofs, but for the same price, you can send one more woof a tenth woof. The dog looks at him with kind of a quizzical look on his face and says, well, then it wouldn't make any sense at all. <laughs> Amen.
We stand for our hymn of the day, God When Human Bonds Are Broken. Led by the light of Christ, let us pray for the church, the world, and all who are in need. <clears throat> we give thanks that God would bless us and everyone who is part of our lives through our faithfulness, and that God would forgive and strengthen us for all the ways we are not faithful. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for everyone whose life has been affected by divorce, we pray to give them healing, comfort, and renewal. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Merciful God, we pray to stop violence and the threat of violence. Hear our prayers for the nations gripped by warfare. Give strength to medical personnel and all who are involved in healing and recovery. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for the church around the world, for our presiding bishop, Elizabeth Eaton, our Oregon Senate Bishop, Lori Larson Caesar, for our pastors and congregational leaders, for partner congregations in the Oregon Senate, that they continue to spread the good news of the gospel. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We, as we struggle with the effects of climate change and other problems that affect our environment, give us the courage to tackle these problems and improve our lives on this beautiful planet. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. God of mercy, comfort those who have the least, those who are lost, and those who are left behind, that they might find support and strength and receive the help they need. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for all those in need of healing in body, mind, or spirit, and for all we name before you, including those on our prayer list. Calvin Rasmussen, Paul Jurisons, Nate Bishop, Suzanne Nelson, Bill Stack, Pat and Gary Andine. For a member who's receiving cancer treatment, also for Judy, Oksana, Don, John, Sharon Alam, Michelle, for Elkie, Maxwell, and Ari, and also for Larry, for the family and friends of John Trom, who passed away recently, and also for Gladys Alban Grace, who also passed away recently. I invite all of you now to include your prayers, whether aloud or silently. Lord, in your mercy, 
hear our prayer. Into your hands, gracious God, we commend all for whom we pray, trusting in your mercy through Jesus Christ our Savior. Amen. Amen. Peace of the Lord be with you always. And also with you. Let us share the peace of the Lord. gifts with God. Let us pray. Merciful God, receive the gifts we bring, ourselves, our time, and our possessions. Through this meal, unite us as your body, shining with the light of your justice and mercy. For the sake of him who gave himself for us, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Lord be with you and also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. It is indeed right and good that we should everywhere and always offer thanks and praise to you, holy God, mighty and merciful, through Jesus Christ our Lord. 
In your Son, Jesus Christ, your eternal light has dawned upon our darkness. And by his death and resurrection, you reveal your glory to everyone, to every nation. So with the church on earth and the hosts of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. Blessed are you, O holy God. You are the life and light of all. By your powerful word, you created all things. Through the prophets, you called your people to be a light to the nations. Blessed are you for Jesus, your son. He is your light, shining in our darkness and revealing to us your mercy and might. In the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread gave thanks, broke it, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. Then after the supper, he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it to all, saying, This blood is the new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. Remembering, therefore, his preaching and healing, his dying and rising, and his promise to come again, we await that day when all the universe will rejoice in your holy and life-giving light. By your Spirit, bless us and this meal that we may be light for the world, revealing the brilliance of your Son. To you be honor and glory, now and forever. Amen. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Gifts of God for the people of God. The body of Christ is given for us. The blood of Christ is shed for us. Come to the table of God.
may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, and the gifts of Christ's body and blood, strengthen, keep, and unite us, now and forever. Amen. 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 Let us pray. We thank you, O God, peace. Keep a little bit of humor with you. You are the light for the world. Thanks be to God. <laughs>